I think the people of this country have had enough of experts. The science has If you changed. count the legal votes, I we easily agree. win. Go for a short it is time to, to get your bricks done. This candle smells like my vagina. It's supposed to be I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. What the fuck is going on? Hello, Mr. Steele. Part of the Acast Creator Network. Hello, I'm Mark Steele. Welcome to episode 20 of my podcast, but I'm still asking the question, oh, what the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on? Aren't we cruel? Owen Patterson was an MP who tried his hardest. It's true, he was trying his hardest for a company that slipped him £8,000 a month to use his position as an MP to make them rich, but he was making an effort, and that's the main thing. We complain that our MPs don't work hard enough, and then we moan if they spend 20 extra hours a week working at being corrupt. We can't make up our minds what we want. Patterson was working for a company called Randox, and they paid him £100,000 a year. And by complete coincidence, they won a £500 million contract to provide the Covid tests. He might as well have been honest about it and said he'd say anything if he was given twenty grand. And then you'd hear, the member for North Shropshire. Mr Speaker, is it not the case that... We buy any car.com will offer you top value for your vehicle. Any, 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 enter your reg number now. We buy any car.com. At one point, he was in the cabinet as well, but luckily, he wasn't in charge of anything important, only Northern Ireland, which is always simple, which must be why he had all that spare time. When Boris Johnson first heard that Owen Patterson was going to be punished for corruption, he probably said, Well, that seems unfair. I thought he was rather good at it. Eventually, the independent inquiry found that Patterson was guilty of seriously breaking the rules. So Boris Johnson ordered the Conservatives to overturn the decision, which is a wonderful way of simplifying the modern world. The thieves who were convicted of the Hatton Garden heist should vote to change the rules that say it's illegal to blow up a wall in a jeweller's and shovel the diamonds in a sack, and then they can all come home from prison. I reckon we should have a bet on the Conservative Party winning first prize at next year's Chelsea Flower Show because then they'll bribe one of the judges and poison all the other flowers and if they're disqualified, they'll just vote to take no notice of the decision and their dead tulip will win anyway. The most touching part of this story is Owen Patterson's statement that the last two years have been an indescribable nightmare. My integrity, which I hold very dear, has been repeatedly and publicly questioned. So he's the victim in all this. See, this is the trouble these days. Too many people think they can get away with bullying the corrupt community by calling them unkind words, such as corrupt. But we should celebrate the Conservatives' brave stand in defence of people seriously breaching the rules of Parliament to pocket £8,000 a month. Then we should reconsider the word corrupt and call them honesty challenged. They'll be on breakfast TV with Philip Schofield saying, I'm from Crook Nation and it's time to reclaim the word crook. We should remove the stigma attached to being a crook. It's high time we rehabilitated people like Geoffrey Archer and Robert Maxwell, whose only crime was to be a crook. A moving film will be made of a young Owen Patterson nervously coming out to his parents. Mum... Dad, there's something that you should know about me. I am corrupt. No, Mum, no, no, there's nothing that the vicar can do about it. It's part of who I am. And we'll learn of a time when you could be jailed simply for following your natural urge to use your position as an elected representative to get contracts worth millions of pounds for a company. And then brave Owen Patterson will lead a corrupt pride march with all the our MPs chanting, We're proud of our tribe that loves a huge bribe. Say it loud, say it proud, we do stuff that's not allowed. But Owen is already an inspiration for the fiddling community because even now that he's resigned, Downing Street are refusing to rule out the possibility that he could receive a peerage. That'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Found guilty of corruption, so they make him a lord. I expect once he's in the House of Lords, they'll catch him wanking into the wall sack and then they'll say, well, in that case, we'd better make him king. 
The way they organised it all was astonishing because they did all that business of overturning the rules and then because there was such an outcry, they told him he had to resign anyway. So it was like one of those Ealing comedies with Sid James and Bernard Cribbins. Here, grubby old Patterson, he's only got finger for the Randolph's job. Blimey, if he gets done, we'll all go down. I'll get some of my boys in Parliament to change the rules. And then the next day, here, the pressure's gone up the wall. Why did you blooming clots phone to change the rules? You told us to. We'll change them back again. But this is the way it's going now. They do whatever they fancy. And if it turns out to be definitely against the rules, they change the rules. Next time Johnson looks like he might lose a vote in Parliament, he'll go, in that case... I have decided to flood the House of Commons. And all the commentators will go, he can't do that. And by the afternoon, the whole place will be underwater and then he'll pour in buckets of piranhas. What the fuck is going on? This week, the chairman of Yorkshire Cricket Club resigned over the county's handling of a report which found that Asian players had suffered bullying and racial harassment. Now, the club originally dismissed this racist abuse as banter. But we're very fortunate to have with us someone who is an expert on racism in Yorkshire cricket, deceased cricketer Fred Truman. Racist? Well, I mean, I don't call that racist. I mean, in my day, we had proper racists. We had Cecil Rhodes. You wouldn't catch him mucking about on Twitter. I mean, he he went to Africa and he colonised the place. We were taught racism at school. I mean, the the teacher would spin the globe on his desk and you had to give the correct racist term of abuse for the natives of whatever country he pointed at. And uh, if you got it wrong, you had to run there and back stark naked. Uh, I mean, one lad froze to death coming back from Finland, but, I mean, he never forgot to call them elk munchers again. Uh, Our wicketkeeper, Billy Arkwright, a very fine man. He absolutely loved racism. I mean, he he was so dedicated uh, one game up at Cheltenham between innings, he went and fought for the Confederates in the American Civil War, commanded a regiment and took four catches and a stumping against Gettysburg. But uh, we had one lad from Otley uh, in the second eleven. He was white as a ghost. But his name was Brown, and that was all the reason we needed him. Mean, we, we filled his jockstrap with plutonium. I mean, he saw the funny side. I mean, we all went to his funeral. It was just a bit of banter. But, I mean, these days, uh, I mean, they can't be bothered. I'd, okay, I give up. It is my enormous pleasure this week to introduce someone who is going to illuminate for all of us what the fuck is going on in this world. Around the nation, stand and applaud for Esther Manito. Hello! Now, what is your family sort of background, geographically speaking? So my dad is from Lebanon and my mum is from Gateshead. That classic combo. We have a connection here in a strange way because in my 40s, -hmm. I discovered that my natural father, and this is one of many, many extraordinary things about him, was a man from Egypt. Because I was adopted, I was always led to believe that my natural father was French. Oh. Yeah, I did all bits in my show about it saying, you know, so... Sometimes I'd say that to people and they say, oh, well, that, that explains why you like cheese. <laughs> but my natural mum had lied. I never met my natural mum. She had lied on the forms and so on. He wasn't French at all. He was Egyptian, a Sephardic Jew who originally, I think his father had come from Lebanon. Wow. Mm. Why did she lie? Well, I don't know. I don't know. That's incredible. What was preferable over him being French? It occurred to me, as I was reading a book by a woman who was brought up in Egypt, who was Jewish, as indeed my dad was. Yeah. And Jews had to flee Egypt after 1956 because the Egyptian nationalist movement took a particularly unfriendly turn towards Jews. And so nearly all Jewish people had no choice but to leave. Yeah. And this woman has written an account about being brought up in a family in a sort of similar time. And she said that they then went to America and her mum always said, don't tell people that your dad is Egyptian. Tell everyone that he's French. And I thought, wow, maybe this was a really common thing at the time. 
that Egyptian people who fled Egypt used to say that they were French because it was sort of a little bit less murky and seedy and sinister and carpet selling weirdy Araby rubbing lampy than than if you were French. Very much true. I think the word Arab terrifies people, yeah. especially at that time. It was, you know, it's the common swear word. It's the common, you know, Arab, gypsy, all of these yeah. terms were used to kind of basically describe somebody who's considered savage. You still yeah. find it now, actually. And I choose very carefully when I say my dad's Arab and when I say my dad's from the Middle East, even though I'm not a massive fan of the term Middle East, because I know for a fact that the term Arab still has this kind of shock factor. Whereas in Middle East, it's kind of like you're, you're introducing it. And so I'll start off by saying my dad's Middle Eastern and then I'll go on to say Arab. But it's almost like if you say Arab off the cuff, you still find some people just kind of doing this. Oh, oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> oh, right. And do they think they look at you and think, oh, lock everything away? No, I don't think it's. I've, I've had it said to me a few times, people saying things like, but you look normal or you're just so normal. Not so much in places that, you know, cities and places where people are used to kind of diversity, but where you're going to. And I, I don't, it doesn't come from a horrible place, even. It's just mm. people going, you're so far from what I imagine that word to mean. And I think because. If I wore maybe a hijab or if I looked yeah. or sounded a little bit, but I think because I'm coming on stage, you know, and I've got an Essex accent, I'm ranting about my kids and moaning about these things, which in their mind, it's like, oh, this is very kind of like club comedy. And then for you to say, I've got this Muslim Arab father, it's just, it juxtaposes. And I quite like that in a way, because I think that's the only way you're going to normalise a word. Yeah, although you're confusing people. And really, if you were thinking about <laughs> people, you would come on in a camel covered in sand in a camel <laughs> did i say you'd come on in a camel <laughs> i'll be the back end the fucking way be an out though wouldn't it <laughs> now there is something else of enormous importance yes which is that another feud which i think is probably going to be a little bit more tricky to resolve than the relatively simple matter of that area of the world from the sykes pico agreement and so on yes and robinson and rachel riley have got into a feud on Countdown, a terrible feud, it turns out. Mm. And this seems like the most beautifully English conflict that you could have, a Countdown conflict. <laughs> Apparently they sort of won't talk to each other. Is it all hearsay? I mean, I can't imagine yeah. Anne Robinson to be the easiest. No. And to me, it kind of smacks of the old... Um, during X Factor, there was that Barney, wasn't there, between Sharon Osbourne and the younger presenters. Oh, yeah. The kind of... Um, we're going to pitch the older woman versus the younger female presenters. Yeah. But it sounds a little bit like she's just been quite snappy backstage and Rachel Riley's getting a little bit fed up of it. Well, you can see it with X Factor, though, because it makes sense to manufacture a row, a contrived row between the judges. But I'm not sure that quite fits the Countdown brand in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that Countdown isn't... <laughs> <laughs> isn't the sexy show. No, 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 it's exactly. It's supposed to be for people of a certain age or a certain disposition to relax through the afternoon and go while away a pleasant half an hour. I mean, with Richard Whiteley, um, he was a bit more kind of afternoon twee, yeah. gentle bants, whereas Anne Robinson, I mean, she's kind of created an entire career of being this snappy, snipey, snarly woman. Yeah. So... I don't know if we're just kind of carrying on whether she's actually self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe that's the way it's going, Esther. Maybe it's getting more and more aggressive. And in a couple of years, it will be hosted by Tyson Fury. <laughs> and it will be like, what? What are you talking about? I don't know the words that you're spelling. It makes no fucking sense. I'm going to pray to Jesus that you come up with a longer word. <laughs> oh, I think Tyson Fury as a host of Countdown would be brilliant, wouldn't it? It'd be amazing. I don't know. I don't know about it. I can't imagine she's the easiest person to work with. I don't know. I've never met her. Or whether it's all just bravado and this is the character she's created in order to become a celebrity. No, I don't know. Or maybe Rachel thing is annoying. Who knows? I think she probably is annoying. <laughs> I'm on Anne Robinson's side, they are. You've How are got you? a bigger side these days. You've got to. You've got to be team man. When I you go and watch what? Crystal Palace later, go with your team man t shirt. Everyone be like, yeah, me too, son. Me too. We yeah, all yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you hear the Riley sing? I can't hear a fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be all in the Countdown audience. I grew up watching Countdown and there was always this like flirty banter, wasn't there, between Carol and Richard? 
Oh, Carol Vorderman. They always had their little flirty bants. Oh, yeah, yeah. We used to find it really funny. I remember being really young and going, oh, God, can they just get on with it? They're all like <laughs> titting about. Get on with it. This was very nervous flirty banter, wasn't it? Yeah. This was very much the sort of the 15-year-old in the school that's been waiting for two years to ask someone out. I don't think anyone could say Richard was a smooth operator. No. <laughs> I can't imagine him being very smooth in the old uh, ladies department. No, there was a brief period where he was touted as the next James Bond. (laughs) Oh, Carol, she'd have to be the Bond girl. Well, she kind of got, she just, she started out, well, she was just this presenter. And then all of a sudden it was like she was the sexiest woman and she was being touted as the sexiest woman. And then it all changed. (laughs) Like I knew her before. Oh, Carol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know, I'm conflicted because I do find her annoying. But on the other hand, I think that obviously, like any woman, especially of a certain age, suddenly is the recipient of just all the filthy, scummy, scurrilous, rotten old male abuse. Yeah, and she's bound to get a lot more hate. And the thing is, with misogyny that women receive, especially as soon as they get into the public eyes, that you're not just battling it from men, you're battling it from women as well, which is the sorry, sad state. I mean, the amount of times I've walked off stage and a woman's come up to me and gone, now, I don't normally like a female comedian, but you were all right. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're a woman. You must go for nights out with friends. You must go out for nights with friends where it's it's just all women. You must do. We've all been there hen do's whatever and you don't all sit around just somberly going oh wish tony was here that provide a bit of banter <laughs> wouldn't it i mean you laugh be a joke. Yeah, you laugh you laugh with your sisters your aunts your female friends what are you talking about oh, i get it a lot from women who'll say things like you know but who's with your children and your poor children you know how do they cope? And I'm like, you're not saying this to the dads on stage. Well, I'm afraid, Esther, that when you get to my age, what happens is your son <laughs> goes on stage and then people come up to the son and say, where's your poor dad who's looking after him? <laughs> my um, my daughter went into school and apparently she told her teacher that when I chased her in the park, I wet myself. And my daughter's teacher told me this. And I said to my daughter, I said, why on earth did you say that? Why are you saying that? She turned around and she said, looks like you're not the only one that can tell jokes about the family. Oh. I was like, oh, oh. I've made you. I've made you, haven't I? <laughs> now, this is a big, huge subject. We just have to cover this. So, fucking poppies. Good thing, bad thing. Well, I, I think I was never allowed to wear a red poppy growing up. Right. My parents were very much like, no, because it kind of sells this glorification of war and what young men are sold into doing and what they suffered through. And my granddad was actually a prisoner of war in Japan. Right. And uh, he was very, very anti the poppy, but he used to make us wear a white poppy. Well, that's fascinating. He was a prisoner of war in Japan. Yeah. Would make you think the generation that came after the war that are the most pro poppy, he's exactly the sort of person that they would say you must wear the poppy for. Yeah, no, he wouldn't. He's very anti. He used to say that the poppy was this this symbol of glorifying as if we've got this nation. And of course they were brave. Of course what they went through was absolutely horrific. Mm. But he used to say to us that it was almost underselling it because there was no need. Like war is, is not a necessary thing. And then these are young men that are forced or manipulated, especially nowadays you know going into very poor backgrounds and signing yeah, yeah, yeah. lads up for perfectly legitimate reasons you know to get qualifications and skills you know in that sense it's brilliant yeah 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 but actually conflict between two countries is not something which is necessary and creates a lot of death and trauma and so we shouldn't be celebrating it we should be wanting peace and so now i wear a white poppy which is what he used to wear. Right. Oh, well, bless yeah. your granddad for that. There's the soldier's song, isn't there, in um, Westminster Abbey, and it's all uh, engraved in the floor in Westminster Abbey. That's right, yes, yes. And I remember I was with my son, and my son was a was a tot at the time. He was like one or something. And it was around Remembrance um, Sunday. And when we were stood and we were reading the soldier's song a really old American man. He was so, he was so old and he just came doddering over to me and he just went, he said, is that your boy? I said, yeah. He said, oh, he's gorgeous. I said, thank you. He said, may he never, ever wear a uniform. And it just, I thought, oh God, what have you been through? What have you had to endure through? So I I just feel there's something really unnatural and... And I can't imagine. It's quite possible that he'd seen really, really terrible acts of violence because he'd one been on countdown <laughs> and he'd 
he'd watch the presenters going at it. <laughs> well, it's been magnificent speaking to you, Esther Manito. I have one other question, which is, what can you tell the good people who, if any, are listening to this, that they should come and see you on or at? Um, I'm going to be on in uh, doing my solo show at the end of this month at Birmingham Glee and also in Bath. And all that can be found on my socials on Twitter and Instagram at Esther Manito. Birmingham Bath. I've seen the show and it's an utter delight. And Thank if you're you in much. Birmingham Bath, you absolutely must go. But if you're in Birmingham, you should go to the one in Bath. And if you're in Bath, you should go to the one in Birmingham. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lots of just discombobulated people going up and down the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Mark. Oh, what the fuck is going on? Now, it's impossible to know what the fuck is going on unless you listen to all sorts of different opinions. And we're very lucky to have with us someone who is the master of gently teasing out opinions, talk show host, Mike Concrete. Right, we've got uh, Ashley Barnett on the line next. He's from a scheme. What is it? To encourage people from diverse backgrounds to take up the opportunities offered in the world of horticulture, if you can believe it. Oh, my good Lord, here we go. What are we protesting about today, mate? Good morning. No, no I'm not protesting. I, I just hope to encourage more people from ethnic groups to take up the... Yeah, so you're saying that flowers are racist, is that it? Um, no, no, I, I think one of the marvellous aspects of gardening is that no matter who you are... It's when did you last have a wash? Sorry? You heard me. A bath. Have you heard of one of those? I really don't see what that's got to do with... Let me ask you something. You want to see more black people gardening, is that it? Well, it, it's not just the black community, it's the Asian community. Anyone who perhaps comes from... Why haven't you asked Jeremy Clarkson? Jeremy Clarkson? Oh, you heard me. You're so keen to encourage black people to take up gardening. So why haven't you asked Jeremy Clarkson? Well, Jeremy Clarkson isn't black. Yes, he is. See ya, Ashley. That's enough of that, idiot. Is it any one of the Chinese are laughing at us? Here's David Starkey with the weather. It's reassuring that so many newspapers and politicians are taking the Climate Change Summit in Glasgow seriously. For example, many of them commented that Greta Thunberg swore during her speech outside the conference when she told the crowd... We say no more blah, 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 no more whatever the fuck they're doing inside there. Thank the Lord these people of influence have spotted the most important story about our climate, which is that a Swedish woman swore about it. Because while we're entitled to be concerned about the human race being unable to exist, there's no need for bad language. Even worse, according to The Sun... Greta Thunberg left BBC viewers speechless after saying pissed off on air. Yes, that's the main thing to get upset about. There are people at that conference from Pacific Islands that are disappearing under the water and when they get back and they're asked, was anything decided, they'll say, yes. They decided that the correct thing to say is, oh, what a nuisance. Our house has floated off towards the South Pole and we're clinging to a palm tree. Oh, dearie, dearie me. When we're crawling around the deserts of Scotland trying to squeeze the last bit of water from a cactus, don't go, oh, that's pissed me off, I've spilt some. Or the sun will go, there's no need for that sort of language. Greta Thunberg responded to all this by saying, I am pleased to announce that I have decided to go net zero on swear words. In the event that I should say something inappropriate, I pledge to compensate that by saying something nice. Because that's the way these green deals work after these summits, where companies are allowed to say, yes, we did dump a billion barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, but we've offset that by planting a tub of bluebells into the Arndale Centre in Telford. And she's right, so this should be applied to other areas. You can do a murder in the morning as long as you offset it by stroking a llama in the afternoon. But there are other important issues to be discussed as well. 
For example, GQ magazine said, We are thrilled to see Mr Johnson wearing an Oliver Brown suit for the start of COP26. It's brilliant that he's championing sustainable fashion during such an important climate conference. Yes, because when the Aztecs were dying out, what they worried about mostly was that the last one left alive was wearing an Oliver Brown poncho. The dodo died out a few centuries ago, but you never heard them cursing or dressing badly, so there's no need for us to do it either. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for the dinosaurs. Now, scientists believe that a giant asteroid struck the Earth 65 million years ago, causing a permanent cloud of dust that made it impossible for them to survive. But worse than that, at a meeting to discuss how to escape this dust, a stegosaurus used the most filthy language that was unnecessary and shocking, especially to some of the pterodactyls who had brought their children. So not only did they die out, but they disgraced themselves with their potty mouths. And now here's us doing the same. But one thing I definitely agree with Greta on is a net zero policy on swearing. And that's why on this podcast, there's a very strict rule that at no point is any bad language allowed. What the fuck is This week, Costa Rica became the first country to make it compulsory for children to be vaccinated against COVID. And some people have very strong opinions about this, especially this woman who I overheard talking in a cafe about it the other day. Well, I heard Richard Madeley on Good Morning Britain talking to someone who was an expert, and she said there was a case in Guatemala where a child had the vaccine and now she clucks like a chicken and only eats corn. So I certainly wasn't going to let Nectarine get vaccinated. And to be honest, Colin and I had a bit of a row about it because he thought she should have one. And I said, darling, you know Nectarine has phantom needle aversion anxiety syndrome by proxy. It was diagnosed by Calvados, our homeopath, so she can't possibly have the COVID jab. And Colin went into one of his sulks, but he's been under such a lot of pressure because he's head of marketing for Pringles for the whole of the Reigate area and he's been working such long hours that I've hardly seen him at all these days but of course we did insist that the nanny got vaccinated because well she's from Bulgaria so we made her have one for leprosy as well and we sprayed her for Dutch elm disease because well you can't take any chances and Tara from the spin class said she read an article in Surrey Life which explains you're more likely to get it if you live in a house that hasn't got farrow and ball paint And now on top of everything, Nectarine's gone and tested positive for COVID, which is everyone else's fault, because if 98% of people had been vaccinated, then she'd be immune. But they just can't be bothered to protect a vulnerable young child. That's the trouble with people these days. It's just me, me, me. Excuse me, could you tell everybody else to leave the cafe? I'm supposed to be self-isolating. What the fuck is going on? Now, as hard as it must be to believe, from time to time, I go away from this particular little podcast microphone and I'm going to be doing shows at various places Hereford, Redditch and I think tickets are still available for the ones that are a long way away obviously not the ones that are imminent and you are more than welcome to buy tickets for those if you go on Mark Steel tour then it will have all sorts of peculiar towns mentioned there where I'm going to be going to also the Mark Steel's in town show will be coming to Radio 4 from December the 1st there are three programmes that were written round about February 2020. And I can't really think what the reason was, but anyway, they seem to have been delayed for 18 months. But they are now being made. We've made one in Blythe, beautiful, lovely Blythe, where I was this week. And then there's going to be one from Whitby and one from Walthamstow. And you can come to those if you apply to the BBC ticket unit. Also, si on veut m'entendre en français, uh, je vais faire mes premiers spectacles en français, janvier prochain, uh, Brighton, la club comédia, et... Uh, uh, le Museum of Comedy, Centreville, uh, Londres. 23 pour le Brighton et uh, 28 janvier uh, uh, Londres. You're more than welcome to come to those, but don't, if you don't speak French, don't come because it just might make any sense at all. And also, I've got a book coming out about my crazy adoption story on December the 9th. Then, uh, Audible, Audible, you listen to books now, you don't read them. Now, many people have sent in messages through the good offices of Twitter to ask what the fuck is going on. For example, at Oitlander says, apparently, Boris Johnson used a private jet running on sustainable fuel in quotation marks, that's what he said, 
to fly to Glasgow and back. What is this magic sustainable fuel? And why don't all planes run on it immediately to bring their emissions to zero and save us all? What the fuck is going on? You're absolutely right, Oitlander. There are two possibilities here. One is that Boris Johnson was lying and that the fuel in the plane that he used to go to Glasgow was the same fuel as all planes use, aviation fuel. We know Boris Johnson does that. He will just lie. He, just, he doesn't just lie to further his career or to say, he just lies. He's one of these compulsive liars. He probably, when he goes home, he says, I, my father invented zebras and I'm currently uh, only having sex with Marie Antoinette and uh, I am the tallest person in, in Greenland currently as we speak he can't help lying or there is another possibility which is that he has actually gone on a plane fueled by sustainable fuel he's just yes i don't know why they don't all use it i just spat i just put three globules of spit into the tank and it flew on that maybe that's true he solved it all and uh, you know so it's either one of those two things at steffi athon says and we have heard from Steffi Athon before, and I'm very pleased to hear from her again. I have been in a South Sudanese refugee camp with no internet connection. Imagine being so desperate to leave your country, you come to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. However, I did download What the Fuck is Going On pod before going. I overjoyed to have my tweet read out, but I had no one to inform, apart from the priests who ran the guest house and some goats. I, I think that's just about the most flattering thing and the most moving response we've had i'd love the fact steffi athon that you have actually gone up to i mean unfortunately with the south sudanese goats probably being unable to speak english they were probably just confused but thank you very very much right we need to find someone in a place more remote than a south sudanese refugee camp with no connection try and top that if you can, I think it might involve an expedition to the South Pole. Now, as anybody who's been listening is aware, we're very, very aware on this podcast that if you're going to try and find out what the fuck is going on, you need not just a diversity of opinions, but a diversity of age groups. And it was with that in mind that several years ago, I bred someone that would be able to help me in that pursuit. Elliot Steele. Hello. Now, what I want to talk to you about this week, because this is something my generation doesn't understand, the way that live streaming works. This particularly came home to me because last weekend, I had possibly the most peculiar, confusing three seconds of my life because I was trying to get a live stream of the Palace Manchester City game and I got the commentary, but I couldn't get the pictures and it was confusing me and it was some sort of illegal stream. And at the same time, the England Australia 2020 was on and this was my three seconds. A beautiful ball from Chris Wokes took Glenn Max was outside edge and he was out and I sort of yelped at almost exactly that moment I heard the commentator say that Wilf Zaha had put Palace one up against Manchester City so now I was sort of in a double yelp peculiar state of confusion and one second later on my laptop appeared a huge penis and now I didn't know whether I was supposed to be thinking about the cricket or Zaha or the penis and I'm still discombobulated from all of this. How does live streaming work? I don't know. Oh, I don't work in tech. No, but how do you know about... You click on all these links. I've seen you click on links. Yeah, I, that, that doesn't mean I know about this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, but you manage to what game of football without a penis coming up, don't you? Yeah, well, you know, it used to be if you were trying to illegally download a film, that you would, it would generally like right. you'd be watching a film and then in the background some weird porn thing would pop up that you'd have to click, like you have to be surgical, like a drone strike and click the right button to get it off. Oh, the little cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, those little cross, but sometimes they try to trick you where they add a fake cross. So you'll click on that. Oh, God. But why does that work? Because you're not going to go, oh, I've clicked the fake cross. So now I might as well watch the penis, are you? Well, I think some people do. It's already stealing. I mean, that is what you're talking about here. You've basically come on your podcast and admitted that you're stealing <laughs> stuff. But when you said live streaming, we were going to talk about, I thought you meant like going live on your Instagram or like on Twitch or something. Oh. Not admitting, 
here's all these illegal things that I've been up to. Oh, yeah. It's like you've come on and gone like, what is it with shooting dogs? And when you're shooting a dog, there's, <laughs> and he's like, what? This isn't, you shouldn't be talking about this, this publicly. Oh, right. Is this immoral? Then I don't know. See, the Bible needs rewriting. Moses now would have to go, oh, we're going to have to cut a couple of these out, mm. adultery and cover it in oxes and stuff. That's probably a little bit out of date so that we can have mm. a thou shalt not live stream, thou shalt not accidentally watch a cock. <laughs> That's the internet, isn't it? It's just like, you know, whatever. But now people send people things like that as well on Twitter and stuff like that. Instagram, mainly. What, porn things? No, just pictures of their dicks. I know. Well, this is probably a subject for another day because this just leaves me utterly, utterly perplexed that people do this. I mean, I was always perplexed about the classic thing, blokes leaning out of a van window. Oh, darling, come over here. And I'd always think, oh, presumably that worked at some point somewhere in the world. There is one story of a woman going, oh, I've got 10 minutes, I might as well. But much less must it work as a sort of means of seduction to send a picture of your knob. Who does that? I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a, I think it's like to do the whole anonymity thing. Like, well, it's not an anonymity, is it? But like people are safe behind their screen where you can do whatever you want. Like you can tweet a racial slur to a footballer and people just hide behind their screen or hide behind accounts. That's kind of the issue with it. So I do this thing on my Instagram whenever people were like rude in the comments about me and they've not got their account on private, I go onto their profile and I find pictures of them and just put them up and start giving them shit. But I've had to take a couple of them down because I felt bad because I saw this one guy, like this one guy on one of my TikTok videos said like my joke wasn't dark and he was like, I've got dark jokes. They're so dark that they're out picking cotton. That was what he wrote. So I screenshotted it and then found his Instagram, and he was a big fat lad. He was one of those guys who posted, like, motivational things, like, keep doing it, keep pushing yourself. So, like, I photoshopped him, like, as the big fat guy he was into the thing he'd put up of keep pushing and being like, this guy's telling people to keep pushing and to keep going. And then I felt a little bad because he was right. clearly about 15. And I thought, oh, I don't want to shame him that much the chances are now that both of us are going to be arrested after this goes out i yeah i don't think mine's necessarily illegal right i think it's just nasty <laughs> but that's really down to where you come on morals more than the law isn't it the bloke in the cafe i was in this morning uh who runs the cafe really nice fella he said oh the thing is with these things now mark you can leave reviews and it's really upsetting mm. it's only a little cafe in crystal palace it's a lovely place and he said my son said oh there's a bad review of the calf dad it's on trip advice and i thought oh no and he was all worried about it and he said when i looked at it this bloke he's bought a donut from here and then he's cut it in half and he's written there wasn't enough nutella in it and he's put that on trip advice <laughs> what a fat piece of shit <laughs> i'm sorry but we have to be allowed to body shame some people <laughs> you can't as a society be at the point where you've got the greatest means of communication ever invented <laughs> and we're using it to complain that there wasn't enough chocolate. <laughs> it is so bad. This is what happens when you just, as a society, you just allow, you, we, we need to stop this. No, everyone's beautiful. They're not, are they? Like, we need to stop it because look at what's happening. Look at what's happening to the beautiful people. They're leaving reviews that there wasn't <laughs> enough chocolate in a fucking... You should be ashamed of yourself. Thank <laughs> you very much Christ. for explaining what the fuck is going on. If you want to see me do more more shaming material, I'll be at Top Secret Comedy Club on Jewelry Lane in London. Thursday the 11th of November at 6pm. Tickets are selling really well, so I'll get them fast. It's on the website. It's free, it's pay what you want at the end, and it's moving. OK, make sure you wear a poppy. Thank <laughs> you very much, Elliot Steele. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you've liked it, please subscribe, rate it, and if you can be bothered, write a review. And if you can't be bothered, definitely write a review. It will be good for your soul and your mental health. We've now got a website, what the F is going on podcast.co.uk. And if there is anything at all that you think I should be finding out what the fuck is going on with it, please send me a message on Twitter at WTF is going on pod, and we will definitely look at all the messages that you send 
end. What the fuck is going on was hosted by me, Mark Steele, with my guests Esther Manito and Elliot Steele. Voices by Sarah Alexander and Pete Sinclair. It was written by Mark Steele, James Serafinowicz and Pete Sinclair. Music by Willie Dowling. Produced and edited by Scott and Matt at Podmonkey. What the fuck is going on is a co-production between Podmonkey and Consec Industries.